Happy Friday. Welcome here to another edition of Husker Online Headlines. Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple. Uh, as we do every week, uh, we go through uh, what we feel are the five major talking point headlines around Husker Nation, around college athletics, around anything, really. Um, and, you know, it's fitting, Steve Sipple. I, I just got back from Chicago, mm-hmm. did a great event last night with the Chicagoans for Nebraska inside the headquarters of the Big Ten offices. It's kind of um, scary that you're inside the headquarters of the Big Ten offices. And so I was in the yeah, and I presented in the conference room to a great group of about 50 Husker fans in Chicago last night at their uh, event they did. But as all this is happening, obviously upstairs, we were on the second floor, on the third floor is where Tony Petiti and the executive offices were. Um, and as like to be a fly on the wall upstairs right now. That were they, were they up there? Well, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, but let's get to the headline. Headline number one, Oregon and Washington are coming to the Big Ten. Obviously, there's a few more T's to cross and I's to dot before we we get official on this. Uh, but it is all but inevitable that the Big Ten now will have 18 teams added into this league uh, with the addition of Oregon and Washington. And, and, you know, what's interesting is Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren um, looked at adding these teams a year ago. Um, but it was kind of pushed back. I think there were a few reasons why. Number one, I don't think he wanted to look like the guy that was going to complete. The Big Ten didn't want to look like they're the league that just crushed the, the Pac-12, like ended the Pac-12. But the other thing is money. Um, I'm sure Oregon and Washington a year ago would have wanted the same deal that USC and UCLA got, which is the best entry deal we've seen in conference realignment where these teams are going to get full shares to the Big Ten. Nebraska didn't get a full share. Rutgers, Maryland did not get a full share. Oregon and Washington, the reports are if they are coming in the Big Ten, it's going to be at a reduced share, probably in the neighborhood between 30 to $40 million per year. Big Ten's estimated to be $62 million payouts next season. Well, it's possible that the Pac – I mean, remember, these teams have alliances to the Pac-12 too. So what I'm saying is, yeah, maybe it's because um, the Big Ten didn't want to look like a bad guy or maybe it's just because they weren't in a rush to leave the Pac-12. Um, they didn't know at that time what the, for instance, what the media rights deal was. That was a long way. That was a long way away. So these teams, you got to remember, they have allegiances. Um, they've been in that Pac, and I'm sensitive to this. They, they've been in the Pac-12 for a long time. I, I'm not, I don't think some of these teams are thrilled to be leaving. Like, I think they would want it to work. But it's survival. It is survival. You know, like you have a viable life raft right now. Yeah, you got to get to higher ground. To save your institution, you don't want to be Oregon State and Washington State. And I I think we kind of know what's going to happen with Utah, Arizona, Arizona State. It appears they're going to go to the Big 12. Yeah, Cal and Stanford is the other wild card um, because there was some discussion with them coming to the Big 10 as well. But that hasn't there hasn't been much of any more on Friday. And my question would be is like, why would they get the same amount of money as Oregon? And Wa- I look at Oregon and Washington as higher value than Stanford and Cal. Well, they, they put people in the stands. And, Cal and Stanford don't. And I thought, you know, former Husker Scott Shanley um, had a really good tweet. Um, and he tweeted something about how exciting it is for Oregon, Washington, USC, UCLA, and their football players. They're going to get to play in front of full stadiums. Uh, will be exciting for all those kids to play at Nebraska, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, and on primetime TV. Travel will be tough to the East Coast, but revenue from the Big Ten will sure help. Yeah. I mean, what we're seeing, Sean, I mean, you got to kind of take a deep breath here. As you're seeing college football evolve from what we've known it, from the kind of the, the, the – we have Regional this, model. Yeah, we have this picture in our mind of what college football – is because it's been that roughly that way for a long time now what we have to do in our roles is try to put in perspective this sort of new look and it looks like we're heading toward three super conferences maybe two two and then the big 12 is going to be a viable third well in the acc we don't know what's going to happen we don't know we'll we'll talk more about acc in in later in the show but um this pac-12 thing is fascinating because we just did schedules. You know, the 2024, 2025 schedules just came out. Yeah. Well, this is going to come into play, I would assume, 2024. Yeah. So what's going to happen to the schedules that we just got? 
a probably they're they're I don't know. Nolan Void is my first guess. And wouldn't it just make sense like the the four Pac-12 teams are all going to play each other every year. Like just just for pure common sense, regional travel and football, USC, UCLA, Oregon, Washington, like they're just going to play each other all year. I mean that's that's going to have to be a given, right? I imagine. I don't know, Sean, I don't know. I don't pretend to know what the schedule's going to look like. But think how long it took for them to come up with that model. I mean, like guys like Scott Docterman do a great – they broke down all the metrics and the data mm-hmm. of this model of how they came up with it. It's just going to be thrown out. It's kind of like in COVID when they came out with three different schedules in one year. Right. Yeah, it's exciting. Now, I would say this. I'm wistful. I've been using that word a lot this week. I'm wistful. I like. I like, I wish it was always 1985. <laughs> you know, and that college football was, I thought, was a lot cooler back then. Um, and even into the 90s, I just thought the product was a lot cooler. But this, this is going to be exciting. It's going to, it's the way this is going to be now has to change. It's, what's interesting to me, Sean, is it's going to change a lot of our conversations dramatically. For instance, we always say, oh, you know, Nebraska's standard was nine and three. And you fired even you, you to the point where you fired coaches that were nine and three. Well, now you can't do that anymore. You can't have that mindset. You can't. It's now this is now I, I know I'll get a lot of pushback for this. I don't care if Nebraska going forward in 2027, 2028 throws a seven and five. We can't all freak out and say we got to fire this guy. Well, it's closer to the NFL. Right. Now. Like in the NFL, right. if you go nine and seven or eight and eight, you make the playoffs sometimes. Right. And right. I'm not, I mean, like the quality of this league and it wouldn't surprise, I'm just throwing this out there. It wouldn't surprise me if they go to 10 conference games someday because That's the tough. amount of money with this inventory. And when you have 20 teams, probably 18 right now, mm-hmm. I mean, the whole point of it is, to play each other and put as many of those games on NBC, Fox, yeah. and CBS. And by the way, ESPN not involved in this at all. So this is kind of a, a multimedia war. Yeah, that's what the, it is. The other three have ganged up where NBC, Fox, and CBS are on a team and they're just pounding ESPN right now. ESPN's got their flag planted or the uh, SEC. Uh, but in the, the Big 12. In the Big 12. Uh, but the ACC, you know, that's, that's the X factor. Because yeah, it is. You, you could see some shake up there, perhaps. And that's why we'll talk more. But like Florida State, can they let them leave? Because then and come over if they, if they were on the table for the Big Ten, because that would then just blow up, you know, the you know entire television package. For yeah. Them. Or, yeah. The, the whole Oregon Washington thing is it's not. Now, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't really elicit a sonic boom, in my opinion, because it's we've. This is we've been talking about this for over a year. This is this was inevitable. It just it had a, the it had to like happen diplomatically. It had to like they had to let this crummy Pac-12 TV deal That's play it. out. That's it. And when George is it Kle- Kleikov Kleikov couldn't give the numbers and the terms, you knew it wasn't. Good. Well, he gave them. Yeah. Well, but, he hasn't now. So what what they're leaning on? It's fascinating. Subscribers to Apple TV. Yeah, subscriber based. Apple streaming, and he's sh- what Kleofkoff tried to sell was there's going to be a market shift, and we're going to benefit in, in the long term. That's just a really hard sell. But how does that work? Like I sign up for Apple TV to watch Ted Lasso, right? Like does the Pac- well the MLB is has it Major League Soccer Fri- has uh, it. MLB's on there just Friday nights. Yeah. That's it. Uh, and, MLS and MLS is exclusively on there. That's it. Uh, but like th- they have a show like Ted Lasso, wildly popular. People signed up for it just for Ted Lasso. So is the Pac-12 going to get a piece of every? It's sixty dollars for an annual subscription. It, may- it might be eighty now, but it, you know it's in that range. If you got a cell phone from Verizon, they would give you free um, Apple TV for a year. I mean, there's just a lot of gray area. That's what I mean, though, when I say the evolution away from college football as we knew it. If you want to watch a Pac-12 game, you've got to subscribe. And it's not like you can click through it. You know, it, you know, a lot of people, when they watch college football, they like to use their clicker and, and click around games. Well, you wouldn't be able to do that with the streaming situation. So, and Kliakoff really, really got taken to school by Brett Yormark of the Big 12. Somehow, 
the Big 12 jumped ahead of the Pac-12 in the sort of the negotiations pecking order, got their deal. The Big 12 gets a deal with ESPN and Fox, which is sizable. Everybody said, Sean, remember whatever the conversation was? Let's see if the Pac-12 can match it. Didn't even come close. You take USC and UCLA out of the Pac-12, though. That that was the death nail. Oregon and Washington are the next two best brands. Absolutely. Um, and I think the Pac-12 had this mentality of, oh, we have kind of academic prestige and university prestige over the Big 12 teams. You know, these are you that know, doesn't it, you inferior can't sell that. institutions. But guess what? It doesn't matter who turns on. The, it doesn't matter when you turn on the TV. You're going to watch. Mike Gundy in Oklahoma State or Kansas State <coughs> over Stanford and Cal. Oh, yeah. I don't care about your academics. I want to well, watch football. Well, that, that's a very red meat way to look at it. But I, And I agree. I tend to agree with you. What I would like to hear, what I would love, and we could do this. We're journalists. I would love to hear a, somebody affiliated with Stanford or Cal sell why they should get a crack at being in the Big Ten. I want to hear a sales pitch from a Stanford alum, from a Cal alum that says, this is why we belong in your league. And hear what that, I just want to hear what that side, sounds like. I can see the big 12, not even being interested in those teams. <laughs> I I mean, would you love to be a fly on a wall for a meeting that involved Mike Gundy and Oklahoma leadership with Stanford and Cal leadership? Uh, I'd be, it'd be uh, yeah, it might be interesting. It might be fairly interesting. I mean, just, just like just the, the, the way that those institutions view themselves over probably Big 12 institutions. Well, what you find, you'll find more of it, Cal and Stanford, are a lot of people on campus, professors, that don't want, they don't even, they, they just assume football go away. It's a it's a hassle. I don't think you'd find too many people at Oklahoma State that would, in Stillwater, that would say, we want Oklahoma, we don't even want Oklahoma State football. I, would you? How many people could you find? Well, like the, the community of Stillwater, of Stillwater would need, they need Oklahoma State yeah. football. Like Manhattan, Kansas needs Kansas State athletics. Yeah. That's part of it. That's part of it. But yeah, Stanford, Cal, they're sitting out there. I just don't. So what? What? What becomes of the Pac-12? Probably it's like the, the the Pac Mountain Conference. Those teams will fold in with the Mountain West. Is probably what you'll see, which wouldn't be horrible. But yeah, there's. I think you regard it the way I do. There's some sadness involved here that the Pac-12 is disintegrating. You know. I think there's some sadness. I mean, they did it to themselves in a lot of respects, though. I mean, just you think about like COVID, how they played only like six games that year, and a lot of those games got camp. I mean, not, not like, even six in some cases. In four, yeah, and like four. You know, there were teams like Stanford that couldn't even practice in California. I mean, right. I, I mean, there were just so many. Well, COVID was one thing. You're right. It hurt. But, I mean, it hurt that league. But when 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 I hear you say they did it to themselves, I'm thinking more of. By not showing up for games with Stanford playing in front of thirty thousand people, I think that would be a good crowd at Stanford. Cal, same way. They just don't. They hurt themselves that way. They didn't. They they really, in some ways, only have themselves to blame. It's not just those two. It's not like all the. It's not like 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 whoever said that earlier is right. These kids will love coming into football country. I mean, coming in to where the stadiums are packed. You know. Um, not everywhere in the Big Ten's like that. Not everywhere. It's not, but m most places. Now think about this: what this does, though, to recruiting on the West Coast. I mean, this kind of solidifies that Cal, Washington. I'm sorry, you, you, uh, USC, UCLA, Washington, Oregon. Those four teams will have a pretty good lock on landing the best West Coast players again because of the league they're in. And the yeah. money, and you know, if they were out on an island away from the Big Ten and the SEC, they're going to lose all those kids. Yeah. And, a lot of them. And they're going to be in a better position to keep their – I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of people on the West. Yeah. I mean, you think about in the two time zones, the yeah. Mountain and the Pacific, there's only there's only 12 Power 5 teams. Yeah. You know, and, and there's a lot of people that live in those two time yeah, zones. Yeah, it, it definitely bolsters their recruiting. It's exciting for them. I, and so I feel good in that sense. It's I'm sure it's there's a lot of mixed emotions with Washington and Oregon people, fans, uh, coaches, AD types. I bet there's mixed emotions. I mean, the Pac-12 was an important league. It was a it was a thriving league for a long time. Going, I mean, you're going back to when USC was dominating uh, with with uh, Coach McKay. I mean, 
it's, I'm sure there's a lot of mix, like I said, mi mixed emotions, but one emotion has got to be excitement. I mean, they're heading into a, a rugged league where they're, they'll have stability and full stadiums and in games that are gargantuan Ohio state USC right off the bat. Come on. Oh, you know, Michigan, UCLA, Michigan, USC. I mean, Nebraska fans got to love this. The regular meetings with Oregon, Washington, USC, U UCLA. Come on, that's fun. It's exciting. Yeah, it's, I mean, Nebraska, and, and you got to give Tom Osborne and Harvey Perlman credit. Yeah, you do. They put Nebraska in this position. Like, if, if, if it wasn't for that leadership back in 2010, who knows where Nebraska's at today? Well, they'd probably be in the Big 12, which came out of it okay. Somehow the Big 12 has come out of this okay. They're, they're the third league. Now, some people would say the ACC. I don't I, – I, I've been reading a lot, Sean, and I'm still amazed how many people put the pecking order as SEC, Big 10, ACC, Big 12. I don't see it that way. I see Big 12 as the number three. A lot of it is like Miami and Virginia Tech, and some of these teams have to kind of raise it up. I mean, the potential is better – is there for that league to be the third. And Notre Dame kind of counts as an ACC team because they play. Well, that's they play I'm, like six games. I'm glad you mentioned that. The one thing that the ACC has hanging out there is the possibility of getting Notre Dame to commit to being a full time football member. That could save the ACC. Notre Dame's sitting out there, but as you know, we've talked about this. Notre Dame clings to its independence. Notre Dame is. I never ever get the sense that Notre Dame's looking to get into a conference. It's they they love their independence. Their college football's bachelor. Yeah, I mean, they, it's, so they, they they like their freedom. But <laughs> that's the ACC's. I don't want to call it a trump card because I don't think it's that. I don't. First, first of all, I don't think it's very likely. But I think that's sitting out there. If the ACC could somehow pull that off, then they might they might save themselves. All right, let's uh, move it on. Headline number two. Uh, before I get to that, though, uh, this part of the show, this segment is brought to you by one of our newest sponsors, Caldera Lab. Uh, it, it's a it's a great product. It's a it's a skin skin cream that you put on in the morning at night. Um, helps eliminate wrinkles, keeps your skin your face fresh. Uh, it's important. I mean, you take care of your, your skin every day. I've been using it now for a few weeks. I've had a noticeable difference on my end. You feel better too. You sleep better. Uh, and we've got a great offer with Caldera Lab right now. Visit their website at calderalab.com and you can enjoy 20% off their best products by simply using code Husker. That's calderalab.com for a 20% discount. Use code Husker calderalab.com great product check it out thanks again to caldera lab for sponsoring us here on the husker online show okay um let's go headline number two and let's shift the focus back to the huskers steve sipple um nebraska in fall camp um you know it's been a relatively quieter opening week obviously we had the miles farmer thing we'll hit it on that next um but you know one thing that has emerged is running back and i i think as you look at this football team right now this is the question. Is running back a strength or one of the strengths for this Husker offense? I, I think it's a strength of the team. I, now, Sean, I, I would ask you this. What position group is stronger than the running back crew? Either side of the ball. It's hard to find one. Because you have would, three guys at running back that have started games. Right. Now, I'm not suggesting – that Nebraska has a, I mean, come on, it's not the best running back group in the Big Ten. It's not probably close. I mean, when you talk about Blake Gorm and Donovan Edwards at at Michigan, the the Ohio State lineup is good. I'm not suggesting that, but if you look at Nebraska and you take you take Farmer, Miles, and Buford out of the Secondary. safety positions, if you have those guys at safety. Buford and Farmer. I might give you the secondary is the strongest position group, depth, starting talent. But you take those guys out, and we don't know how long Buford will be out, Marquise. This is an injury situation. He'll be back at some point. We don't know when. But as it stands right now, I'm saying running back is, a, is the strongest position on the team. Now, I will say, like, tight end could find itself up there. Like, yeah. let's just say absolutely, Harry Gilbert just comes out and, and looks – like yeah. a million bucks. Well, we, he's got to get we out. Think. I mean, we, we don't even know if he's going to be eligible. And yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Right. The the questions around Gilbert 
and then Fedoni just not proving it. Right. Tight end could immediately become a strength. It could. Um, receiver could be yeah. really good. I mean, Xavier Betts could have yeah, a breakout be, year. Yeah. Billy Kemp's going to be good. Marcus Washington, that hand injury, it's interesting to see how that's going to affect his reps and development here in August as he gets to cast off this yeah. week. Receiver's um, but there, I mean, there's a few, but you're right. I mean, I, I think you know you have three backs, Gabe Urban Jr., Anthony Grant, and Ramir Johnson that have all started games before. It really, it really sounds, Sean. Okay, so just so people kind of understand our methodology here, we listen closely to what the coaches and players say at these news conferences, right? We all do that. You have a lot of sources. I have some sources. So it's kind of a combination of what you're hearing publicly and then what you're sort of hearing behind the scenes. And what I've ascertained about the running back position is it Irvin's got a leg up right now. Gabe Irvin, 20 carries, only 20 carries last year for 94 yards. It was banged up. But it seems like really starting in the spring, he, there's so much talk from the coaching staff about Irvin. It looks like he's carried that into camp. The question I have about him is how will he how will he look with this kind of new physique? He's way bigger. I mean, he looks like Eddie George. He's really he's big. Huge. Now. Yeah, he's big. He's now he went from 212, he's six foot. He went from 212 to 225 in his muscle. Now, can he still move? Like he was fast. He's one I got of the a kick out of him saying, I, I like to eat. Yeah, he likes to eat, but he obviously likes to lift too. So what will that look like? What's he going for? Is my is he, is he just trying to get consistent four to six yard runs or when his shoulder pads get square, he's going to go forward? Yeah. Or or is he yeah. trying for home runs? Because I feel like, and you're on the same page, I think Anthony Grant can give you some of those home runs. Yeah. And I think, well, I think Irvin's probably straight line speed is faster than Grant. So what's he going for? I think he's just going for it all. I mean, I think he, I think he wants to give you, Sean, those three to five to six yard runs where I, you, you put it really well, where you, you know, get your pads square and, and you fall and ran big and play Big Ten football. But, there but I is. think, look at that big boy. He, yeah. I think he's all swole there. I mean, it, he must have just got down bench or something. But yeah, it looks like you have to plan a fitness. Yeah, that's that, that, that's that is what that they hit the like. bells in there when you're in there lifting, right? <laughs> if you if you're going too hard at Planet Fitness, they, don't they hit like an alarm? I I've never heard it, um, but that's allegedly they do that. Oh, they, they don't do it for you in there. <laughs> they, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, I. <laughs> I, you know, Grant, Sean, the other thing that you kind of hear at, from the coaches and in, in these interviews is I guess Grant's had some problems with pass blocking that they have to, he's got to fix that. And you just wonder how that factors into the overall discussion. But I, you know, Ramir Johnson, okay, would I be surprised if on August 31, Ramir Johnson was the starting running back? No, not at all. Wouldn't be surprised. If he, if Ramir Johnson somehow catches a heater in camp, you could you could start a Big Ten game with Ramir Johnson at running back and feel pretty well, I mean, good. He, he made plays to almost beat Michigan in 2021. I think people forget Michigan good against Iowa the, last I mean, year. Michigan went to the college football playoff, and, and he made plays to almost beat them. Yeah, he made a great over-the-shoulder catch. And then against Iowa, he played well last year. He, in, he ended last year. Tough, tough year for him. He didn't play much, but looked good running the ball against and Iowa. And he's a fifth year. I mean, it feels like he's been here 20 years, and he's still have, he, boy, you like that though. He's still, I mean, he has one. I mean, this COVID thing, he can come back another year. If he you like, to. you like that? See, that's what the top three guys in that room Six are years. grown men. They're grown men. I mean, they're men. You don't have boys. The Irvin's a grown man. He's now. a third year player, but in, Irvin, yeah, he, no, I think he's fourth. Gabe Irvin came in 2021. Okay, so he's third. Yeah, he he started as a true freshman in 2021. Make sure you're right about that. But yeah, he, oh, yeah. He, okay. He was the first true freshman to start a season opener at running back. In you're, I history. think you're right. Grant's a grown man. He's a uh, six year. Six year. Ramir Johnson's a grown man. Fifth year. Now the question, if you're really getting into this, is is there is there a pretty sizable drop off from three to four? You know, it's Emmett Johnson. Is it Emmett Johnson? I was Emmett Johnson, who looked okayish in the spring game. Is he ready? If he, because it, Sean, it's not like a quarterback discussion. This is a running back discussion. You can get down to four pretty fast. We've seen it a lot. So is he ready? That's, and then is Lubin yeah. the walk on? Yeah. They mentioned him a lot, actually. Yeah. Though. Lubin must be pretty good. Wahoo kid, right? Yeah. 
So those are your those are your guys. And then Quentin Ives, freshman. Uh, yeah, he's he's they got to get him rolling. You got to have five, six guys ready to go. Yeah, you know, I mean, the thought of only having like <laughs> Satterfield says, I wish we'd had Bo Jackson. Well, that's that. the other discussion is the committee, the committee discussion. And I asked Gabe Irvin about that. And, you know, he says, I'd like to be the guy. But what they're, then he kind of, then he described kind of the mindset in the camp, which is it's a committee kind of mindset. They want to be relentless. They want, they don't want a tired guy out there. They don't want tired legs out there. They don't have to have tired legs out there. But I would tell you this, Sean. If if one of those guys separates, if he's, you know, if Irvin comes out against Minnesota and rushes 22 times for 140 yards, he'll be the guy, right? I mean, that's so there's always that possibility that this committee approach could kind of go by the wayside if one of these guys a hot hand. Yeah. All right, let's go. Headline number three, and you know we thought this was a strength going into fall camp. Things have kind of changed, though. What does this Husker secondary look like without Miles Farmer? Maybe potentially even Marquise Buford for an undefined amount of time. I mean, I'll start with that. What is your expectation for Buford? Do you think we could see him at all in this early part of the season? Oh, I don't know about early part of the season. I mean, if he's not in camp, then you know, which he's not. Then it'd get really, it'd get really difficult for, for him. And Buford a, is a, oh that man. I mean, he's your best safety. Um, so that's a tough one. I I don't, Sean. I don't know when you're gonna when you're gonna see him. He hurt that leg against Wisconsin. Again, not in camp. And and that 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 means I would say, I would okay. This is a guess. I would venture to say October you know, early October. Does that sound plausible to you? Yeah. And I, I look at the secondary right now and, and Isaac Gifford, we assume Quentin Newsom. I think Deshaun Singleton's going to be a factor. Tommy Hill, you know, there's guys that you just don't have a great read. Omar Brown, you would think is a factor. Corey Collier though, we know is a factor. Mark Malcolm Hart's Doug. I mean, they have probably six or seven guys that we can just name off right now. But remember it's a three, three, five. They need five guys. Yep, they need a rover. I mean, so yeah, Eric Fields now playing rover. Um, he was, a, by the way, in Chicago. That was a, a people love Eric Fields, his film and his potential. God, yeah, they like he got, got him at rover. There's some guys that you forget about, like line. I mean, you forget about Morton. Um, Javier Morton came in kind of under the radar when he arrived, and you know, even like Kane Williams was a safety. He's a linebacker. Javin Wright was a safety. Now he's a linebacker. John Bullock was a safety. Now he's a linebacker. He can move somebody back. I mean, so there is some people that have potential um, that can move, you know, to different positions. I do think in that freshman class, sincere Safiala is a name to watch. Yeah, corner. So, yeah, I don't. It's interesting. They have body. I mean, they have enough talent. It's just identifying the right guys for those starting roles i think they have enough guys to choose from that can get it done i do think that especially at corner with newsom and hartsock i think you feel pretty good if, if you're if that's what you're going to roll with i think that and i think they like Corey collier a lot i do too um and you look I, at, I would be surprised if he's not one of the starting safeties now who's alongside him gifford yeah is, well maybe if Gif gifford's a rover too if they want gifford at rover that it might Did be you single confirm that by the way. Did you get a read no. on that yet? No. We got to we got to ask Matt rule that tomorrow. Now, we'll see if he get he gives it up. You bet someone's on your butt about asking about if they're going to see a team movie this year. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we'll get that in, but I, I don't it's not a training camp question. Not necessarily. I think that's a question for like I think the guys being facetious. M M Minnesota week. I put it in tunnel talk. People always ask me, do they still do the team movie thing? They don't. They didn't last year. Well, what ended up being a problem I heard on the team movies is they had a hard time getting guys to agree on what to see. Yeah. Because people's – what they want to watch is different. You know, like yeah. there's wide ranges of movies. And I, I think, yeah, it's really hard to get an entire group of players to – I mean, think how many movies they're going to see in a year. 12 movies. Right. So I don't know if there's a movie. And I don't know who's the Rovers, who the Rovers are. I, we got to figure that out. I think they would like Gifford to be the rover. Every coach did those like on the road. I'll never forget Mike Riley, what they did on the road. They didn't do a movie. 
and they would just like let the players like go out to eat with their families and see their families. And like, I remember there was a Hooters next to the team hotel and there were like players eating at Hooters with their family on a Friday night before a game. I mean, every coach is a little different how yeah. they do that time on Friday night. And it'll be interesting. And you know, Matt rule has a plan. Yeah. I it's, Sean, it was a tunnel talk item. Not a, I just threw in and no, it's not, this is not, not a headline. This is not hard news. No. Well, pe the, people like the little details. Yeah. The little S Steve Sipple nuggets. Yeah. I mean, the movie thing was a long time tradition. I, I don't know if I want to call it a tradition, but every, you know, they did it. You know, it was an, I mean, remember when they stayed, the East campus had that hotel. I'm, I'm sorry. East campus had a hotel, like an on-campus hotel. Okay. And that's where the team that's stayed. That's right. They did stay there. And then that, that's no longer a hotel anymore. It's, it's, I think it's office buildings or something else. And so then they, they moved to North 27th street for yep. years. And then under Polini, yep. they moved over to the Cornusker Marriott and they, they've been at that Cornusker Marriott, I think really for, for a long time since, since Polini. Yeah. And I think they figured out quickly. It's a lot better setup. Um, and a, a lot of road teams will stay at either the graduate, the North 27th place or, or, Omaha. or the embassy suites right off that interstate there. So in Omaha. Papillion. Papillion. Yeah. yeah. The, I mean, it's wide ranging um, where teams stay when they come to play Nebraska. But all right, we kind of got off the path. Yeah, let's we go, did. Let's go headline number four: um, turning the page in fall camp. Um, you know, we, we've had a lot of things happen. The Bob Wager situation. Yeah. To start things off, Miles Farmer, Joshua Fleeks, two <laughs> Joshua Fleeks, um, two practices going on at, at separate moments or separate times for at least three days: Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Yep. Uh, living in the dorms um, that they, they've gone on every day this week. Saturday will be their final practice of the week before their first day off. One would assume there might be a scrimmage built in this week. Yeah, it could be a Saturday scrimmage. I, I wonder if they're ready for a full blown scrimmage. That I would think they would be because this is not this is not 1995. This is uh, this is 2023 where they Sean they practice in June and July. I mean. That's one thing that if you talk to coaches nowadays, it's fascinating what they say about how the summers have changed. It's not like the players go away during the summer, then reconvene in late July and say, okay, camp's here. So let's start it all again. No, they've been being coached over, over the summer. Sean, there's install. I mean, they're, they're in, there's installation that yeah, you goes get on. Basically, those two practices, and we were over there for camp, mm -hmm. summer football camps. And it was when those practices were going on and the, the players all wear their jersey. Yeah, it's it's so I guess the answer to your question would be yes. I, I think they'd be ready for a scrimmage if that's what Matt wants to do. This thing with the two people have really gone at me on this, that Mike Riley did something similar, but he, it wasn't done like this. Well, explain that. to people. So Mike Riley during spring ball, at least one year, he split off in the same practice and they, they had another field going with other players and they divided the team up into two, but the, the everybody was out there simultaneously at one time. Right. What Matt rules doing is two separate two hour practices right. where the same coaches coach and work a double shift. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's completely different and it's in August. Yeah. And, yeah. Riley I, didn't I, do that. And I don't know why. I mean, people are really like mad at me. Like, no, Mike Riley didn't. No, no. like Michael Sevier's lit me up on text. A couple posters on the board. <laughs> okay, Sean. I don't get it. Like, it's like, look, it's okay. This is August. This is like the time when this this counts. Like they're yeah. practicing football to get ready for a game. Yeah. The spring is developmental. And the, the players came out as one team and then they split off on the separate fields. They've done that on Nebraska for years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm people on the board really, it's weird. Like some of these guys have just been sword fighting me all day on this. Yeah. Thing. It's, I yeah, sat no, in you're Chicago right. at breakfast this morning answering like 10 questions about trying to explain why this is different than what Mike Riley did with. Yeah. I don't think out. Riley ever did a situation where he had 60 guys in a practice and then 60, in this case, it's 60 less experienced players or newcomers in another practice to get them reps. You can't do it that way other than August anyway, because of the 20 hour rule, right? This is the only time of the year. You're not restricted to either the 20 hour or the eight hour rule. It's a good idea from the standpoint that Satterfield pointed out yesterday that it gets, you know, there's, there's going to be freshmen at Nebraska that through one week of practice, get about a hundred reps Whereas at other schools, there'll be camps, entire camps where a freshman doesn't get a hundred reps yeah, in the entire camp. 
Nebraska got their, their young guys got that in four or five days. So that's why they do it. Now, the thing about it is, like you, you saw the quote maybe from I think it was from Marcus Satterfield, where you do this for the you do this for the long term. Okay, that's good. But you also got Minnesota on August 31st. So it was just three days though. It's just three days. Yeah. And and maybe rule will slide in another day. Who, who knows? Like right. it, but I think it's a really good way to open up camp. Yeah, and it's a good way to get guys reps, which it's sort of a nod to Tom Osborne rules mentioned that that osborne has told him you can't i i know that it graded on tom i mean really graded on tom when he would come over to practice and see guys standing around that conversation has been going on for quite some time because tom's practices and, and i know people get tired of this it's reps reps bit. reps yeah i used to watch him they had four three or four stations going and it was an incredible machine that was working because you'd see just at Memorial Stadium two of the stations going. And, yeah, it was rep after rep after rep. And, you know, when you're running the option like they were, Sean, as you know, it's timing. So timing oriented. you got to run it a lot. It's always funny to me when people say, hey, they should throw in some option. Well, if you throw in option come Saturday, you might run it, and it will look like you just threw it in as opposed to having a well-timed, you know, good looking option system where, but if you're commit to that, you have to run a lot of reps. That, that's why I think that's a large reason Tom did it. Yeah. And it, you know, having a roster that big sounds good in theory, but you got to use the players. Right. And yeah. And, and make it worth their while. Yeah, and, you couldn't fit them all Memorial Stadium. He would have two stations going, maybe three, two for sure going to Memorial stadium. And then in, in another station or two going out outside the stadium on the grass fields. So that's how, yeah, it was way different. But the, you know, the, the, the overriding theme being from Tom, you can't have a bunch of guys standing around, which we've seen that a lot at Nebraska under multiple coaches. Too many players standing. Well, and you know, another better. thing in this first turning the page on week one is the facility and, and getting that done in the locker room and, oh, and yeah, all those huge. things. It's huge. And yeah. It's made considerable progress. Um, we're going to pull up the feed here of the construction camera here, but you look how much work they've got. I mean, it's starting to look like a football facility. It is. It's fascinating. We we have to walk through there a lot. It's. I would say that the construction workers, you see some stress. I mean, it's like they know there's a time. There's a time. There's. there's it's. I mean, they got to get this thing rolling. I mean, this is not what we thought was going to be the case, right? That that on August 4th, August 5th, whatever the hell it is, that that would be not even close to being done. I mean, I, I was amazed the other day. Sean. Here it is. Take a look at it. Look at that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. I was amazed yesterday. They were they just took out the sidewalk in front of them on the north end of Memorial Stadium. You weren't there yesterday, but if you would have walked up, you would have seen they ripped that sidewalk out. Where yeah. you walk to the practice availability. They rip that sidewalk out almost every year. Do you know why? No. Because they just salt the hell out of it. Anytime oh. there's like, you know, severe oh. you know, snow and ice. Okay. I'm guessing for liability. I mean, they, they put as, I mean, they just dump bags of salt on that and it just destroys that concrete. So that stadium concrete almost gets replaced, I would say, every year because of the amount of weathering it takes well and they it's not you know they, they don't open until mid-september at home right am i yeah right? so they, they got till september 16th so it's not pressing that is one nice thing about the schedule is that you know they're they're not home till week three right september 16th and it gives you know like Hausman and those guys can work on the weekend i mean they could be over there all weekend working doing something they are i, mean, I imagine they are but yeah that field it's interesting to me that i mean i I guess they're probably confined by the space they have, but that this is only a 50 yard piece of turf. Like what the thought is for this field turf here to be a, just a 50 yard field. Like, hmm. you know, like what there probably wasn't any possible way to put a hundred yards in there. That's kind of surprising. Like if they could have, if there was a way to bring it out, but it's a hundred yards, a lot of space. So, yeah, but you, they can still do a lot of situational things on that turf. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the inside of that building. Well, yeah, that, that's coming together. All right, let's go closing the show with headline number five. And we're going to cover a little bit of a lot of ground here. Let's start with Aaron Ulis, the Iowa transfer for basketball to Nebraska. 
he is caught right in the middle of this big gambling scandal that's hit both Iowa and Iowa State. And if we were like a Des Moines-based media outlet right now, this would be what we'd be talking about all day. Yeah, um, with Euless, and let's see what's going on here. I, I imagine there's schools all over the country watching this. What's what makes Iowa a little different in this situation is becoming a criminal investigation, Sean. It's the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigation. I think that's what they call it. And it's, you know, there's county attorneys that are that have looked into or lo are looking into this. They're looking into tampering of records. And I think when they say tampering of records, what they're talking about is these these student athletes using other people's names on their account to shield their own names. Um, I think, I think that that's largely what we're talking about. It's the, as you, as you would expect, the conversation is a little nuanced, but, and it's, listen, this is, I'm, am I'm amazed a little bit by the world right now. There's a lot in the world that just amazes me. I'm amazed at some people, how they say, sip, this is no big deal. This is no big deal. This, this, this is players gambling on their own sport and in some cases a kicker a kicker at iowa gambling on his own team picking the under it's no different than pete rose right picking the under against iowa state and winning i mean <laughs> just think about it. on that conversation pete rose yeah and the penalty he's paid for this right one of the greatest baseball players of all time is still not in the Hall of Fame because of this situation. Right. So Hunter Deckers is the Iowa State quarterback who's in hot water because of these, you know, we'll call them allegations. But, you know, there's a, there's a, there's charges against him. There's an on, ongoing investigation. It's the NCAA, but it's also whatever county Ames is in, the county attorney's looking into it. Hunter, Hunter, see, his attorney said, Hunter Decker's attorney said something I thought was sort of alarming. He said, you, what you have to understand is that there are thousands and thousands of student athletes who do this. I don't know what to make of it. I, it's easy to do, though. I don't think you or I use DraftKings. No. That's what these kids are using, a lot of them. You can just do it on your phone, though. That's what's, that's what's happening. It's not, Sean, you, you, when I was a kid, when my dad or whoever would talk about placing a bet there's a bookie in you'd town. go to the corner bar yeah there's I mean, a bookie we had a bookie in my high school in south omaha like, sure you could put like 10 20 bets in where a guy at our school was a they call them runners uh -huh. and, and they ran for a bookie and then right. they collect so them. now there's no need for all that rigmarole rigmarole you have right on your phone you can place a bet and in there's no seconds. privacy like when you make a bet people right. have access to your data Right. And that, I think that's the, the lost part of all this. I, I think when you make a bet as a, one of these guys, you're like, oh, no one's going to know. I mean, there's millions of people in the world. How are they going to find me that I made a bet? They can. And, they, and that's what we've learned in all this. That right. Not only will they find you, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. They, they, can, they can track your phone. They knew, for instance, one of the reports about Ulysses is they knew where he was making the bets from. He was making them from <clears throat> areas that, Iowa, the University of Iowa, that public doesn't have access to. They they know where you're making like the making bet. them inside the facility, right? So <laughs> that's great. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a gig it's a gigantic story, um, and it is it has wide ranging ramifications. And it's let's face it, Sean, it's not. It could be damaging to the popularity. I don't like to always do this thing where we go hyperbolic on everything, but. It's you find out that kicker at now the kicker at Iowa didn't participate in that Iowa Iowa State game, but he is now their number two kicker. He's and if and if he goes away, which he will, Iowa will be down to one kicker. Um, and we should mention that if if it is found that they gambled on their own team, they they lose eligibility permanently. They're done. Hunter Deckers won't play for Iowa State again. I don't imagine. You just think about. NIL, I mean, all the extra money these kids they have, have. They have money. They have, I mean, th then gambling is now legal. I mean, it used to be you had to go to Atlantic City or Vegas to gamble and yeah, place bets. You don't have to, now. Now you can go to – I mean, Columbus, Nebraska is building a Harris. See, that's the thing. It's so <laughs> – it's, it's, it's very pervasive in our country. So that, I think that's why some people say, calm down. This isn't that big of a deal. 
because gambling has become so pervasive in college athletics. But if you're involved in the outcome, that's the deal. That's the problem. I mean, that's <laughs> right. I mean, it's I mean, it's just it could get really ugly if you think about it. You know, your team loses a close game and you wonder why that that kicker. Now, wait a second, that kick wasn't even close from 30. What's the deal? It, you know, a kicker, if a kicker misses from 30, the spreads the spread, it affects the line. A lot of people are see, this is the issue you, that you'll have. Yeah, he missed that, Sean. He missed that bad. Like it, like you almost would say he ooh, looked like he tried to miss that. The one that freaked me out was that Alabama baseball coach. How he got fired, where mm -hmm. he phoned a tip that their their pitcher wasn't going to pitch, yeah. and, and nobody knew, but he knew, and he knew. And then some guy put in that ten thousand dollar bet or whatever it was in Ohio. Right. Um, That's based, what I mean. I mean, it's insider stock trading. Yeah, it is, it, and it could affect the way people. These are not. Unfortunately, we're having in college athletics a lot of sort of unpleasant conversations. Um, I'd like to make it more pleasant. Nebraska plays Minnesota August 31. It's going to be a good game. It's going to be a good game. Right, let's talk ACC. Oh, yeah, ACC. Teams. Fascinating. Because I know and you do a radio show on 93.7 The Ticket, and your co-hosts use the words, it's a joke book that Miami or teams like that would be considered from the Big Ten. But is it a joke book? Is it a joke? to think that some of these ACC teams could be in line to join the Big Ten knowing where we're going right now. Oh, I don't I don't know. I mean, Miami to the Big Ten, I guess. I mean, and, and I don't want to say anything's possible because anything's not possible. Because the SEC doesn't really need Miami, do they? I suppose not. What, what do they need Miami for? Well, if at some point the SEC is going to have to consider expanding if, you know, if the if we're gonna, if we're talking about super conferences down the down down the line, see, yeah, the SEC to me, they're really in a good situation right now because they're. I think they'd be somewhat resistant to more expansion, but they might be they might be put in a situation that they have to. Florida State's much more interesting to me than Miami because Florida State has been so vocal about that their situation in the ACC has to change. And what it is, the essence of it is very simple, Sean. With their media rights deal that's in place until 2036, they are effectively $30 million annually behind SEC and Big Ten teams in, in revenue Clemson, from their media rights Clemson deal. as well. $30 million behind. And what the Florida State President, Richard McCall is his name, has been saying is we can't we, at Florida State we want to compete for national ch championships but how do we compete with the, the Ohio States and Michigans and Georgias and Alabamas when they're thirty million dollars annually ahead of us and it matters and that's that's um, assistant coach pay um, that's head coach pay head coach pay that's facilities right. that's resources weight rooms ev everything that Nebraska is getting right now. Mm -hmm. It took to this point to get all that Big Ten money and get it rolling to where Nebraska absolutely could hire Matt Rule. I mean, if I would have told you in 2009, Nebraska would have been able to get a coach like Matt Rule for that price for 12 million like, at the end at the end of his con I mean, at the end of his contract, and not make the Panthers pay for most of it. Right? I mean, no, it's so that's what's happening. There's some schools in the ACC that have been led by Florida State, and mostly Florida State. In fact, the North Carolina AD said, this is getting ridiculous, Florida State. Tone it down. They're kind of like Nebraska in 2020 in the Big Ten, where Nebraska was very vocal about wanting to play football. Yeah. Everybody else kind of was telling Nebraska to be quiet. It'll be off. It's off-putting to some eight, the North Carolina AD, for sure, who called him out and said, stop your whining. I mean, you're in a good conference. We're in a, we have a good situation here. But Florida State's been strangely vocal about, well, they just want the revenue distribution to change. They should, they think it should be reflective on results and marketability, marketability, and th they're more marketable than say Boston College, than say North Carolina State, Wake right? Forest. Yeah, yeah. So that's they, they don't they don't think there should be equal distribution. And there's not. They've changed it. They've changed it. It's based more well, that, on results. Now. You know, that used to be how the Big 12 was, where it was but before 
Nebraska, I mean, you got money based on kind of what your status was and the games that you got on TV. Yeah, that's what Florida State wants. And that's how the original Big 12 deal, because, you know, back then, like, there were times where Nebraska would get a game on pay-per-view because, I mean, Nebraska wouldn't tell you this, but they were making more money on a pay-per-view game than they would be making on if a game was on, like, FS1 or it would have been, like, Fox Sports Midwest. Why? Because everybody had to pay a subscribe. Everybody had to pay, like, 50 bucks, 40 yeah. bucks, and they would sell the hell out. I mean, everyone wants to watch those games. Mm-hmm. See, Nebraska is viable – was viable is viable because of because of the fan base because the fan base is that you know any conference is going to be attracted to nebraska because they get those eyeballs on tv uh, and that's not every school i mean not by a long shot can say that but that's that's the essence of the conversation all right well it's going to be fun to follow uh lots yeah. going on this weekend well, full coverage on practice, but make sure you like us down here. Follow us, subscribe to us here on the Husker Line YouTube channel. Uh, we got a great fall camp special running through the week here. Get a month for a dollar or 25% off an annual, which is now $75 on the special. That's at HuskerOnline.com. Uh, you can also get us on the podcast side. Anywhere you can find podcasts, just simply type in Husker Online. For Steve Simple, I'm Sean Callahan signing off for another edition of Husker Online Headlines.